amount of dollars times the, not the amount they're, they're moved, okay? It's true that M times V equals the amount of money there is in the system. But there is a break point between that and the price versus quantity. And the, the, the break point, it does eventually fade, but, it's, but it does eventually feed back toward that, but it never reaches that. Again, this is a chaotic orbital system. The value of a dollar is never equal to the quantity times the price. The, times the price. It's sometimes above it, sometimes below it. It circles around it. But go ahead. Question. I was just going to say that that equation came out of the School of Economics when the School of Economics thought that the epitome of, of science was physics. Right. And, they, and in particular, classical physics with its concept of an equilibrium. And an equilibrium is essentially, in chaos terms, a point attractor. And therefore, they everything they assumed would get to equilibrium. And we don't have to worry about it, how exactly it gets there. Those are just details. Right. And that's and like that's that's a, that's a good point, Ivor. It's essentially the problem with teaching, with treating economics as a statistical fear. Okay? Statistical analysis makes that assumption as part of statistical analysis. That it's all going to average out in the end. And within limits, it does. In economics, in weather, in plant growth, it never actually averages out. It circles around, but it never actually averages out. And that's a big difference. The other big difference about chaotic systems is they're much more subject to minor deviations. You can tweak them just a little bit and get deviations that go off the wall. Uh, one of the examples of that, though it's a pretty big plump, it takes, it takes time for minor deviations to propagate out. But a major deviation can have a major effect. And the stagflation of the 70s was caused by a perceptual de deviation. When the uh, Arab nations got really teed off at the West over their support of Israel uh, in the 70s, they put the oil embargo in, the price of oil shot through the ceiling. The perception of the value of a dollar and of most other European currencies went down. The actual amount of dollars did not go down, just the perception of what they were worth. We had inflation, but not enough money in the system to support the economy that we already had running. So we got stagflation. Inflation, the money is valued at less because people think it's valued at less, not because there's too much of it. But and not enough money in the system to support economic growth or even the economy that we already had. And that, that disconnect between what people think money's worth and the amount of money in the system is what causes deflation. Almost an opposite effect of that is why money hasn't deflated in spite of the fact that right now, M times V, because V has shut shrunk so drastically is significantly less than M times V was in 2007. When the crash in 2008 happened, V dropped through the floor, right? <coughs> M did not change at first. Since then, the, uh, the Fed has been pumping M into the system massively, but that increase in M has still not compensated for the loss of V. What makes economists that actually know what they're talking about, I am not talking about Rick Perry here, <laughs> but the people who know what they're talking about, worried about it is what happens when the confidence comes back, banks start loaning again, and V shoots through the roof. And they've already put all the M back in in the system to compensate. 
but they're dread, dreadfully afraid of what the Fred Fed is is terrified of what even those members of Congress I think there are two of them who know what they're talking about or afraid of is that <laughs> maybe one <laughs> is you, that, yeah, you're really optimistic <laughs> no he's from Texas <laughs> Uh, is that once confidence comes back, these are going to increase, and then we'll have an inflationary situ situation, a drastic inflationary situation. I don't think that's going to happen because, again, because of the disconnect. The big problem isn't, isn't having too much money or too little money, it's having a, the, an amount of money that does not match the perceived value. And a lot of that, one of the, the big reason that money, that we haven't, didn't have a depression, is oddly enough, a bunch of crackpots who didn't know what they were talking about screaming about there's too much money in the system. They convinced enough people enough to keep prices from dropping. So they kept us. Thank God for idiots. They kept us from falling, they kept the economy from falling through the floor due to being afraid that of, of, uh, of the money that the Fed was putting into the system to compensate but for the decrease in monetary velocity. Yeah. So I'm going to ask a question that's going to take you back to the fictional universe. Okay, okay. good. Um, so, so, and obviously I've been reading ahead. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you about the setting of the forthcoming book, and we'll and just Viennese walls or no Kremlin gates. <laughs> Kremlin gates. Okay. okay. So so we have a situation there. They've recently completed the draft of their novel set in Russia. Gordon Paul. Draft. Oh, fine. Okay, it's fine. Fine. Let's see. They, they, they submitted. It's a fine. draft. It's the it final draft. It has been, has been turned in. Accepted. Thank you okay. very much. All right, fine. I'm sorry, it's just ER? not scheduled for publication yet. September of next year. There we go. Okay, I'm so completely behind. So now that that's done, you have a situation in Russia mm -hmm. that is quite different than what you've been describing oh, just yeah. now because oh, yeah. you have a situation where they're really, actually, period, no question about it, dumb idiots can decide there isn't enough money. Yeah. Right? I mean, the, the yeah, all right. Russia in the 17th century had it, it had gold, it had silver, it didn't know where any of it was. <laughs> Effectively, Russia in the 17th century had no gold, no, no native gold, no native silver, no access to them except foreign trade. Basically, they had to go buy their money from the Netherlands, uh, from Spain, from France, and mostly yeah, through. No, a little bit. Mostly it was through the Netherlands and England. Uh, when you say money, meaning they're buying gold and silver. They're buying gold and silver to print to mint rubles. Uh, and yeah, but they to get money they had to go out and, and, and buy it. So Russia was spending its capital, its, its real wealth, to get enough money to make the economy work, and they still didn't have nearly enough. They paid their people in temporary land holdings. They paid the bureaucrats, the soldiers, in temporary land holdings that could be taken back if you got a demotion. And uh, because there simply wasn't enough money to run the system. Now, your question about, yeah, they, it takes a, an absolute idiot to realize they don't have enough money. Uh, and they, they do realize it as soon as they get the book as soon as they get the um, get uptime or information, they start the czar prints up, sets up the czar's bank and starts printing paper money. Because that's the solution to this issue of before that we had to literally buy our money from somebody else. Right. Okay. But they had there was no shortage of wealth. There really wasn't. No. Okay. And and the part that I didn't understand. Okay. Um, and I'm going to ask. Okay. So you said that they paid people by giving the people temporary holdings of land. But just holding the land doesn't pay you anything. So presumably... You've got to have service on it. Okay, so, 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 so 
what you're getting is the income from the percentage of the products that the serfs are producing. Right. Yeah. And this is a source that I'll, I'll think we'll change a little slightly or we'll take a little couple of tangents to it. This sounds like they're paying land to these people the way at one point kind of a banking system started to generate itself in England about 60 years later. Uh, uh, where they were, were issuing checks and then people were buying selling those checks because they didn't have enough silver? No, not no. quite. They actually won Russia wasn't that good at the paperwork. Right. Um, they didn't but, have checks. They or were lay grants that you could yeah, no, 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 I understand what you're saying, and it's a it's a good and valid question. What they were doing was actually more like a limited bureaucratic form of, of feudalism. Basically, you get they would pay you, you're say a colonel in the Russian army, right? They would pay you a few rubles a year. The actual money, a little bit. It's not enough to live on. They would also give you seven villages. Those villagers have serfs in them. Uh, they would also loan you seven villages. Those villagers have serfs in them. Those serfs farm the land, they produce the wealth. You get a share of that corn or wheat or uh, pigs. pigs, whatever. And then you try and sign, trade that. And often it was literally trade. You're trading a pig for some cloth. You're trading barter. A, yeah, it's a, it was a it was essentially a barter system. Even the government was operated on a barter system, which has the problem of if nobody right around you wants the things you have, you're screwed. You're screwed. Sorry. Or if they if they only want half a pig. Right, and that's <laughs> really <laughs> what. Or if they only want. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and the problem, of course, with that is one, you've got to calculate how much money, and two, you've got to convince people it's worth something. Now, Gresham's law is a valid law in certain circumstances. Gresham's law says that bad money will always uh, push out good money. Basically, what happens is anytime you've got two kinds of money that are legally equivalent, say a silver ruble and a paper ruble, and people think the silver ruble is worth a lot and the paper worth ruble's not. They put the silver ruble in their pocket and they use the paper ruble to buy stuff. Or to light the fire, right? Well, no, they actually, it's, they use the paper ruble to buy stuff. Now, this is assumed in economics to be a very bad thing. It's not really necessarily that bad. Think about it. You're going to issue, you're the government, you're going to issue uh, a million rubles this year to finance, well, even with Russia, it's 30 million rubles. Uh, and that's an off the top of my head figure. I heard, please. It's just off the top of my head. It's not in text. Don't start screaming at me. Uh, you have to give a look to get that effect. It's great. Uh, but, you think? Um, <laughs> reputation. <laughs> reputation is everything. Uh, but you put that money out. Now, people start taking the silver that they've got. They put it in their pocket. They don't spend it unless they cannot avoid it. They take their money and they run the economy on that money. And that's fine with you because it doesn't, it doesn't hurt you at all. It just means then you can print more money and without oversaturating the economy. As long as they've got their, so their silver pieces, their silver rubles in uh, a tin buried in the backyard, 